All right. Okay, welcome those of you that are joining on Facebook Live. For those of you that are here, open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. I'll put on my eyeballs so I can actually see what we're reading. And you can follow along as I start in verse 5 through 13. For those who live according to the flesh, think about the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, about the things of the Spirit. For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mindset on the flesh is hostile to God, because it does not submit itself to God's law, for it is unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God lives in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies uh, to life through his Spirit who lives in you. So then, brothers, we are uh, not obligated to live uh, to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Let's pray. Fathers, we come this evening. Once again, we thank you for your love, your care, for the things that you have done, and for the fact that you are informing us about them through your word. Uh, as we consider uh, the state of being that we find ourselves in, being in Christ, we're thankful that there's no condemnation, but we do recognize that there is uh, new not only responsibilities, but uh, capacity to fulfill those responsibilities. Open our eyes and our hearts to the things that we need to see here so that we may truly live according to who we are in Christ Jesus. For it's in his name we ask it. Amen. Okay, so this is Life in the Spirit Part 2. If you missed Part 1, you can go back to uh, YouTube in a week or so, look up Edgemont Bible Church, and uh, I'm sure you'll find it. Uh, the Spirit changes our nature and it empowers us for victory. So the Holy Spirit changes our nature. Now, uh, nature is one of those words that uh, you do see in the Bible. Uh, for example, in Ephesians, it says that before we were saved, we were by nature children of wrath. Okay? So what came out of us came from our nature. We were children of wrath, so we acted as children of wrath. When we come into the uh, new covenant as participants, God gives us a new heart, a new spirit. He puts his spirit within us. He writes his laws on our hearts and does things to cause us to walk in his ways. So in essence, he is giving us a new nature. Uh, before we were twisted away from God, now we are twisted toward God, or if you will, the twist has been straightened. Now, sanctification is the process of getting the lifestyle to match up with who we are so it may not look like we're twisted toward God or straightened up, if you will, but uh, ultimately that does happen. So as we're looking at uh, the idea of the Holy Spirit changes our nature, he is uh, doing that which is necessary so that we don't continue to walk the way we used to. So notice 4, uh, verse 5 starts with the word 4. It is referring back to verse 4. Uh, notice, um, let me read that for you. Verse 4 says, In order that the law's re uh, requirement would be accomplished in those of us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Okay? So when you're walking according to the Spirit, uh, you are going to fulfill the law's righteous requirements. But what does that mean? Uh, when we look at other places like Galatians chapter 5, we say walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Um, for the Spirit lusts against the flesh and the flesh against the Spirit so that you cannot do the things that you want to. Uh, whole point being there is walking in the flesh. In Romans 8, he's talking about walking according to the flesh, which we're going to see the definition here of what that actually means. It means you're not saved. So if you're walking according to the Spirit, not in the Spirit, you're saved. And again, we're going to see that as we go through here. Uh, you can be saved and not be walking in the Spirit. 
okay? Uh, as Christians, have you ever been upset, and, you know, hit your thumb with a hammer and shouted, praise the Lord? Or did you shout something else? Well, that was probably a good thing, probably walking in the spirit. But uh, if you've yelled something else, that's walking in the flesh, not according to the flesh, okay? So you can be... Uh, uh, be walking according to the Spirit and not necessarily walking in the Spirit. So uh, notice it refers back to verse 4, and it carries the idea of because. So this is an explanation uh, in these next several verses of what it means to walk according to the Spirit or according to the uh, flesh. Number two, from God's perspective, only two kinds of people live in this world. Uh, this is one of the difficult things to uh, help Christians understand. Uh, we struggle with the idea that there's only spirit and flesh. We think that somewhere in the rush, we can walk somewhere in the middle. And therefore, when we look at sinners, we see, ooh, evil person. Ooh, religious person, but not saved. He's kind of neutral. Saved person. Oh, see, we have three qualifications. God doesn't. God has two. They're either walking according to the flesh or they're walking according to the spirit. They're either unsaved or they're saved. That's how he sees them. Uh, so notice uh, John 3, 6 says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 14, but the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So two, two types of people. When we get to the uh, word according to, it refers to the basic spiritual nature, or if you will, the fundamental essence or the bent or disposition. Remember what I said about Ephesians chapter uh, 2, 1 to 3. We were by nature children of wrath. We were bent towards uh, Satan's way of doing things towards our flesh, and therefore the only thing that could abide upon us was the wrath of God. Once we're saved, that bent has been changed. That doesn't mean that this body doesn't have its issues. We've already talked about that in chapter 7. Uh, the literal translation of according to is those being according to. See, when we get up to Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8, we're talking about a difference that salvation has made in a person's life, or if you will, justification has made. We died with Christ. The old is gone. We were buried with Christ. We were raised again to walk in newness of life. Now, that's where our struggle comes in, but that's what 7 talks about, the latter part of chapter 7. Chapter 8 is telling you how to have the victory over uh, the struggles against the flesh. And so that's where we find ourselves at this point. We are those that are a being according to the Spirit. So the, uh, it goes on to say, they set their minds on. 2 Peter 2.10 says, And especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority, they are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. See, their mind is set on a certain way of living, and it shows itself in a lot of different ways. The word there in the Greek is phroneo, to exercise the mind, to entertain, to have a sentiment or an opinion, to be mentally disposed, more or less earnestly, in a certain direction. Uh, so the, you, uh, you see, again, this concept of a bent or a disposition. Number two, it refers to the basic orientation bent, or thought patterns of the mind. Oh, let me see. How many of you were saved as adults? A uh, few of us here have been saved as adults. Uh, so therefore, we had enough time to develop certain patterns of thinking that now when we look back on those things, we recognize, whoa, we were kind of out there. Uh, we're kind of ashamed of some of the patterns of thinking. And after we got saved, those patterns of thinking didn't disappear just like that, did they? It took a period of time. It took 
truth washing through our minds and starting to understand spiritual truth before we could learn how to overcome those things. And that's the idea here. We were bent in a certain way, and uh, through uh, being born again, God changes that. So the two kinds of people that God, uh, from God's perspective that are in the world, first of all, we have the unsaved. You'll notice I have letter B there instead of letter A. Every now and again, my outline gets uh, away from me. <laughs> so we have the unsaved, those who live according to the flesh, uh, verse 5a. Notice here's the description of them in 5a and 6a. They set their minds on the things of the flesh. It includes false philosophies, religions, whether overtly or subtly, it appeals to the flesh through self-interest and self-effort. Uh, now, before I even had an inclination toward being religious, my uh, mind was set on the things of the flesh, uh, independence, self-sufficiency, lust, things like that, okay? It was all about what was going to please me and how I was going to get it. That's the idea here. When I did start to have religious inclinations, now it's a matter of me being good enough from my perspective to please God so that he would accept me. That's still self-effort, self-interest, not considering what God desires out of the whole thing. So whether you're a religious person or a fleshly person or a heathen, you know, uh, my wife was talking to someone down in Florida at the airport, uh, and the lady said, oh, yeah, my dad was a United Methodist preacher, and my wife goes, yeah, our whole family grew up Methodist, and I said, yeah, we were just a bunch of heathen. A uh, lady got a big kick out of that, <laughs> but uh, uh, that's, that's the way it is uh, th as far as being unsaved. Notice uh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh. Verse 6a says, for to be carnally minded, the word there, notice it is very sim uh, similar to letter B under number two there, they set their minds on. It's phronema, uh, mental inclination or purpose. Uh, notice they, they are carnally minded, and that is equal to death. Uh, notice Paul does not say it leads to death. Okay, re re again, remember, God sees unsaved, saved. We see evil unsaved, pretty decent unsaved, and saved. And we even classify those guys sometimes, and we shouldn't. But God sees one type of unsaved person. They are dead. Ephesians 2.1 says, And he made you alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Not dead, but a fairly decent person. Not dead and really wicked, just dead. Okay? So for to be carnally minded is death. Notice it is a state of being, not a consequence. When do we become spiritually dead? We are born spiritually dead. It is a state of being. It's not somewhere in the rush we decided to do something that we knew was wrong and then became spiritually dead. No, we're born that way, and so that is the description of an unsaved person. Notice number three, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. And again, uh, verse 7 there, as well as 1 Corinthians 2.14 uh, which I read earlier, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit. They are foolishness to him, uh, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Uh, the word here for uh, enmity is ekthra. Uh, it means hostility, a reason for opposition, enmity, hatred. Uh, if you look in the political realm right now, uh, we do not see... Two groups of people that have the same interest in serving the people of this country just with different means. We have two groups of people that do not like each other. Now, one might not like the other one a whole lot more, but the reality is, is they are at enmity against one another. Now, they are respectful in their enmity. All you got to do is watch some of the little things that go on uh, videos, uh, C-SPAN or whatever, and they're always calling, I'd like to say, to the uh, la a chair lady or the uh, chairman or something, and then they say what they're going to say. 
and they don't cuss them out most of the time. <laughs> but then when you look at how they look at the people that they're <clears throat> serving, and I'm pretty sure there's quite a bit of hostility towards them also. More from one group than another, but I'm not sure that uh, the Republican side of things is just hunky-dory with what people think about them all. Because if they were, they would realize we need to change the way we do things. <laughs> so, and again, people don't like talking about politics. Christians stopped talking about politics a long time ago and look at where we find ourselves. It's not a matter of pushing a view on someone. It's a matter of we see within politics the enemy of our souls working out his plan. And you, all you got to do is look. If you're not certain, Read through the Gospel of John, see how the Pharisees and the Sadducees work, and consider how the politicians are working. And it's kind of like, wow, it's the same methodology. So I'm just using that as an example. Okay, so hostility. Notice here, here's how that hostility is shown, that enmity. It is not subject. The carnal mind is not subject to the law of God. Not only that, it can't be. And that's why for us to look at unsaved people in two classes, the wicked unsaved and the pretty good neighbor who's religious, we are wrong, okay? The religious person does not submit itself to the law of God and can't. I remember having a discussion with my sister years ago, came home from Brazil because uh, my dad had passed and... Um, I stayed with my full-blooded sister, and somewhere in a rush, we got into a discussion about God. And she said, well, my God isn't like that. And I said, then your God isn't the God of the Bible. Because that's what he says about himself. And it's interesting, if you go back to the Old Testament, you'll see God rebukes Israel on two counts when it comes to how they viewed him. First of all, they viewed him as being like them. And the second thing was they didn't think they were going to have to give an account. Wow. Um, my sister viewed God as being just like her. And therefore, anything that she was going to decide to do was okay because God would approve because he was just like her. And therefore, wasn't going to have to give an account for it. Whoa. So at enmity against God, uh, it's not subject to the law of God. It can't be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot, cannot please God. I don't care how religious they are, how devout they are, uh, how, how many good things they can do. I remember years ago when Mother Teresa was still alive, uh, Mother Teresa was looked upon by many Christians as... Wow, what a great lady. The good work that she's doing out there, she's got to go to heaven. She petitioned the Pope, John Paul at the time, to declare Mary to be the co-redemptress of our salvation. Down in Columbia, the country, not uh, Missouri, uh, <laughs> they actually have a uh, crucifix with Mary on it. Topless, loincloth, uh, crown of thorns. Um, no, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, they cannot please God because they don't have it within them to do so, which brings us to the other kind of people that God views, and those are the saved. No, notice in 5b, those who live according to the Spirit, and it goes on to say, um, on the things of the Spirit, you'll notice I have it in italics there, set their minds on. That's understood in the context. They set their minds on the things of the Spirit. This is the result, again, of this new covenant. Now, I know I've read this over and over and over again, and uh, maybe it's because I'm just enthralled with what God did, what God said he was going to do, and what he's done. Okay, now, he said he was going to do the, this with Israel, but then he brought blindness to them to bring us into the whole thing. And notice what it says. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. 
I will cleanse you from all of your filthiness and from all of your idols. I will give uh, you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my ways and you will keep my judgments and do them. So this is, uh, we set our minds on the things of the Spirit because God has changed that which is necessary to be changed so that that's what becomes important to a saved person. Uh, Notice to be spiritually minded is life and peace in 6b. Uh, Life because uh, where do we get life from? You know, Jesus said, uh, I will give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Uh, Now, he also said that he came that we might have life and that we would have it more abundantly. So you can be a born-again believer and have eternal life, and you can be a born-again believer and experience abundant life. What Romans 8 is trying to get across to us is, first of all, understand who you are because you're in Christ. No condemnation. You're now spiritually minded. You've set your mind on the things of the Spirit, and that's life and peace for you. And it'll uh, go on a little bit more as we go along. But uh, get to experience the whole thing, not part of it. I don't know about you, but as I look back over my 40 years of being saved, I recognize Man, there, there were years where I was just kind of floating through. I was just gliding. Uh, you know, I was doing the things that Christians do. But I was also not purposely setting my mind on things above. And therefore, I was leaving myself open for deception, for believing lies, and for falling into temptation because of that. What a waste of energy and time. I had eternal life, but I was not experiencing abundant life. And that's what he's uh, called us to do. Okay, so it goes on. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit in verse nine. And again, three, six, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. So you're not in the flesh. Okay, you're not in the realm of uh, the flesh. Notice he goes on to say, uh, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. The word for dwell there, oikeo, uh, basically oikos uh, is house. Uh, so you see the idea of to occupy a house, to reside, to inhabit, to remain, uh, to cohabit, to dwell. Uh, he goes on to say, now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Okay, uh, I, I don't know how many young people, having been a youth pastor, how many young people have told me uh, they're going to heaven because somewhere in the rush they said a prayer. Okay, uh, I remember going to camp one year, Camp Sanago, which is coming up, by the way, uh, get online, sign your kids up and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it cost $2,978,000 this year, I think, because of inflation. Uh, you'll have to check that out for yourself. But um, I went there as a counselor and, and thought to myself, this is the only time I'm ever going to get with some of these kids. So anyone that God puts in my view, we're talking gospel. So I started talking to all the kids from good Christian churches about Jesus. I want to make sure that they had all heard the gospel at least once by the time the week was over. If they came to work on canoes or be a part of my team, we're talking Jesus. And um, by the end of the week, I had uh, counselors upset with me because I was causing kids to doubt their salvation. No, I wasn't. I'm just saying if you're depending on the fact that you said a prayer, that's not what saves a person. It is only by putting your trust in who Christ is and what he did on the cross of Calvary. And um, uh, that's when pastor met me and said, hey, how'd you like to come over here? It's kind of like, I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> so, uh, but uh, whole point being is uh, if the Spirit of God dwells in you, that's uh, the proof of the salvation. Uh, it goes on, now if anyone does not have the Spirit, he is not his. Notice the opposite reality is stated. He's trying to make it clear. You either are in the Spirit or walking according to the Spirit or you're in the flesh walking according to the flesh. Uh, notice where there is no evidence of the presence power, and fruit of the Spirit. 
There is no legitimate claim on Christ as Savior and Lord. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, Examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know your, uh, yourselves that uh, Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. Um, again, Pastor and I have both been preaching this for a while. We need to be a little bit more intentional. Um, in those years when I was uh, wasting my time instead of being intentional and uh, falling into some of the same sinful habits that I'd been involved in before I was saved, uh, if there wasn't that occasional opportunity for repentance and things like that, uh, I would have been left to believe that yeah, I'm, I'm not saved. And I'll be honest with you, uh, every now and again, the flesh rears its little ugly head and you kind of wonder at times, you know, can you even be saved and do what you just did? And it's kind of like, yeah, you can, uh, but it can't be a way of life for a person. If there's no fruit of the Spirit, if there's no desire to live for God, one should tr truly question whether or not uh, they have the Spirit of God. Notice, no desire for things of God, no inclination to avoid sin, no passion to please God. Uh, that would be an indication that maybe you haven't been changed. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old is past. Behold, all things are becoming uh, new. He goes on in verse 10, and if Christ is in you, he says, the body is dead because of sin. Uh, notice if we go back to chapter 7 and verse 17, uh, but now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. As we already pointed out, he wasn't trying to uh, escape responsibility for his sin. He was recognizing that as a new creature living in an unredeemed body, the battle still went on. So when he did sin... The new man wasn't the one that was doing it. It was because sin was still dwelling in this body. Um, so sin dwells in me. Notice number two, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Verse 18 says, for I know that in me that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me as a new creature. I want to do what God wants me to do. But how to perform what is good, I find not. Uh, and again, you'll notice he's not talking about um, the desire. The desire is, I want to do what God wants me to do, but I don't have it within me to do it. And that's why chapter 8 is so important. Uh, we have to understand that it is only through the Spirit. So notice uh, uh, letter uh, number 3, a law. In 721, he says, evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. And then in verse 23, he finds then a law warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity. So the body is dead because of sin. Or another way of putting it, the, the human body, new born again believer living in this human body, doesn't have the capacity to produce that which is glorifying to God by himself. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. If we're going to live as believers in a way that's pleasing to God, we have to be experiencing the abundant life. We have to be walking in the Spirit. We have to be uh, filled with the Spirit. There's a lot of different ways that it says it, but it is through the Spirit that we experience that life uh, because of righteousness. Number five, summing up verses five to 10, all done in verse 11. He says, but if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Well, Who's the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead? Well, obviously it's the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.24, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Romans 6, 4 and 5, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 6 14, and God both raised up the Lord and 
will also raise us up by his power. And 2 Corinthians 4.14, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. So you see it is God that is the one that is doing it. Uh, elsewhere, we see that it is the spirit of God that has been given the, uh, the task to do that. But the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now, let's just reconsider verse 10 and 11 together. In 10, we basically saw that the body was dead because of sin. It didn't have the capacity to produce that which was glorifying to God. But in verse 11, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. So he's going to give that which is necessary so that you can produce that which glorifies God even in this body. Yes, sir. Well, sanctification is the process by where, whereby he is making you more like Christ, but the more you learn to submit yourself to that sanctification, the more you're going to be uh, not only looking like Christ, but living the life that Christ has for you, uh, has provided for you. So notice the spirit who gives life, uh, the flesh profits nothing. John uh, 6, 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Now think with me for a minute. What does John chapter six talk about? John chapter six does say that the person who believes in Jesus will have eternal life. And then shortly thereafter, he talks about eating his flesh and drinking his blood so that you can have eternal life. And of course, people have misrepresented that all over the place. But the idea of eating something and drinking something is it becomes a part of you. And when you truly believe, it becomes a part of you. This isn't some intellectual ascent where we do church on Sunday mornings. There are plenty of people that come to church on Sunday mornings because that's what you do. I mean, I'm a Christian. You go to church on Sunday mornings. No. Sunday mornings is just an opportunity for us all to get together. We're doing, if you will, the worship of God seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And when you're not, okay, now we're confessing sin. That's called worship. We're agreeing with God about something, resubmitting ourselves to him. That's called worship. It's not just singing the songs and feeling the feelings. <laughs> okay? Uh, so... Um, let me read on here. The spirit gives life, the flesh profits nothing. Uh, but notice he also uh, makes us sufficient as ministers. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 6, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And, and so whole point being is the spirit of God is the one that makes us sufficient uh, does uh, empowers us so that we can actually live the life that God has called us to live. It is not through following any rules, not through our own effort, etc. cetera. Uh, so he changes our nature and letter B, the Holy Spirit empowers us for victory over the flesh. He goes on to say, therefore, brethren, he is reminding them of the privilege of being believers uh, he, he's, because of what I've already told you, we're going to go on to uh, what else is part of it. But notice, brethren, I'm talking to you as other believers, those who are now walking according to the Spirit, those who have been cleansed, those who have a new nature. Um, he goes on, ex uh, well, I go on, exhortations and admonitions are based on blessings and promises of God in his word. In today's day and age, why is the world trying so hard to teach our kids at a very young age all about sexualization? I didn't want to just say about sex because though some may be doing that, they're really sexualizing everything when it comes to our kids. Um, why? 
because when you get them pointed in that direction, they're already bent in that direction. The chances of coming out of that, well, it's obviously going to be a work of God, but uh, they, they know if, if I can get them while they're young. You know, I, I don't know about you, but math, science, history, the good and the bad, okay? The CRT, well, I think we should be teaching the truth about the history of slavery. I'm pretty sure I got a pretty good education on the history of slavery. There was a lot of bad. There was also some good. Uh, no, it probably wasn't like roots most of the time. But they did consider them as property. It was wrong. We fought a war. Settled it. Now, there's still all kinds of things that go on. Why? Because the heart of man needs changing. Okay? And oh, by the way, the things that are going on are happening on both sides of the fence. It's not one side or the other. Um, for a believer, of course, there's no place for any of that kind of junk uh, get over it. So exhortations and admonitions based on blessings and promises of God and his word. Notice the pattern for victory. He says, we are debtors. The word debtor there is opheletes, um, an owner, person indebted, a delinquent, a transgressor against God, a debtor uh, which is owed or a, a sinner. Notice we are debtors not to live uh, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, uh, Romans 6, 7 and 6, 14. For he who has died, now he's already said, I think three times in the first six verses that we died with Christ. So he who has died has been freed from sin. It's no longer my master. Verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Uh, so we see there that... Uh, uh, we are not debtors to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. The word flesh here, uh, definition here would be an ugly complex of human desires, including ungodly motives, affections, principles, purposes, words, and actions that sin generates in the body. Again, there's a law of sin in this body, and it generates. It still tries to influence. It doesn't have legal right to mandate but neither did the governor. Never mind, uh, pretend I didn't say that. <laughs> um, but it, it still does everything it can to influence. So notice, uh, to be ruled and controlled by the ugly complex. That's the idea of, being, of living according to the flesh, to be ruled and controlled by that ugly complex. He goes on to say, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Galatians 6, 8, for he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Um, think with me for just a minute. Jacob, I heard a message here recently by one of the Irish, Scottish guys. Uh, it wasn't Alistair Begg, it was another one. Colin Smith. He's got two last names. Uh, but he was using this passage and he referred to David and he referred to Jacob. And he goes, you know, whenever you go in a direction that God wants you to go, doesn't want you to go, God always lets that ultimately be what happens to you. So Jacob was a deceiver. And then what happened? Well, he was deceived by Laban. He works for seven years to get little old Rachel. And he got Leah. And then he worked for another seven years to get little old Rachel. And then he worked for him for another 20 years, I think, and changed his wages 10 times. Uh, and then not only that, later on, after they leave Laban in that land and come back to the land of promise, uh, his own kids deceive him, making him think that Joseph had been killed by a lion. And uh, they actually had sold him off into slavery. Of course, it's all found out, but notice, he sowed to the flesh and he, he reaped what he sowed. Uh, David did the same thing uh, with his sin with Bathsheba. He ends up uh, committing adultery, uh, killing uh, Uzziah, uh, lying about it for uh, at least nine months. And then he gets really angry once 
he's told a story about someone that did something similar. And Nathan says, you're the guy. At which point he loses the baby. His daughter is raped by his half uh, brother. The half brother is killed by the daughter's full brother. Then that brother dies. Four others are destroyed because of David's sin. He, He got it back. So he reaped the corruption of sowing to the flesh. One of the things that maybe we need to be a little bit more intentional about is understanding that if I'm heading in a direction and I know, especially when I know this is not the way God would have me to go, but it's so tempting and you you believe the lies, it's going to give me what only God can give me. Just understand, you go there and it's going to come back on you. You're going to get it. And I'm not saying that God's going to get you. I'm just saying that's how he works it. Your chastisement will be, you're going to get of like kind of what you put into it. So therefore, don't put into the flesh, but into the spirit, because you are obligated uh, to live according to the spirit. Um, Notice, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. It is not referring to losing salvation. Uh, If you're not sure of that, go back to the first page, uh, letter A, number two, verse A, or letter A, number one. It refers to the basic spiritual nature, fundamental essence, bent, or disposition. So this is basically saying that an unbeliever is going to be the one that is doing this, living according to the flesh. But if by the Spirit, uh, this is the only source that overcomes the flesh. Remember verse 2, chapter 8, verse 2, it says, because the Spirit's law, or the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, sets me free from the law of sin and death. Back there in chapter 7, he talked about that law of sin that was in this body. So he wanted to do right, but he couldn't do it because of this law of sin. And he's saying, you want to know how to overcome that? It's the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It is learning how to walk in the spirit. You're already in according to the spirit because you're saved, but now you've got to be filled with the spirit. You've got to be, be walking in uh, the spirit. Notice he goes, but if by the spirit... The only source and power to overcome the flesh. Uh, And again, remember, A, 4, A, 1 through (sighs) 4. So, 4, oh, that's right at the top of the page there. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead, uh, sin dwells in you, your flesh can't do anything good, there's a law of sin in you, you don't have the capacity to produce that which is glorifying to God. Uh, So we see again here, uh, consider the focus of the person that overcomes. Okay, Galatians uh, 5.16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What's he concentrating on? What's he thinking about? Living in Christ. Uh, 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. What's his focus? Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. 1 John uh, 4.4, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. What's the focus? the one that is in me. Uh, 1 John 5, 1 to 5, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Okay, let's go back and walk in the flesh for just a moment. God says, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. And we're looking at that and saying, wow, that'd be really fun. And how easy is it to say no? But everyone is drawn away of his own lusts and enticed. He's seduced. He's believing the lie. At that point, the commandments of God are burdensome. So obviously this person in chapter 5 is not focusing on the temptation He's focusing on Christ 
God's love, things like that. They're not burdensome for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Now, it's not faith. It's faith in the person and work and therefore wanting to please God and therefore making a decision to do what God wants you to do. And the Spirit of God comes along and uh, empowers that. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, Several years ago, a book came out called The Gospel Primer. Uh, They were about that thick, and they cost five bucks. Now they cost 15, and they're about that thick. (laughs) They haven't changed anything. They've just gone up. Um, And basically what the author was trying to say was, look, as believers, we need to be remembering, preaching the gospel to ourselves every single day. And I remember hearing a dear sister say, that's just really kind of silly. No, it really isn't. Uh, when I remember what it took for me to be saved, I was agreeing with God. I, I, I couldn't do it. It was only through him. Oh, now there's a lesson that we all as believers can use every single day. Uh, and that's where we find the victory, when our focus Uh, when our thoughts are where they are supposed to be. So uh, consider the focus of the person that overcomes. Number two, you put to death. Uh, But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body. Ephesians uh, 4.22, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Colossians 3.5, therefore, Put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So uh, it really does mean that we're saying no, but not just saying, well, you know, I really shouldn't, but we're putting it to death. We're actually doing something so that it doesn't rise up in us. (coughs) Excuse me. Uh, The word put to death there is thanatou, uh, to kill, to become dead, to cause to be, to put to death, to kill, to mortify. It requires a recognition of sin in our flesh. And again, you go back up to the top of the page. The body is dead because of sin. Sin dwells in me. There's nothing good that dwells in this flesh. There's a law of sin and evil that is present with me. Even though I'm born again, I want to do right. Uh, that's, and it's warring against the law of my mind. Uh, it, uh, it brings me into captivity. I do not have the ca- capacity to do that which is glorifying to God in and of myself. I need uh, the Holy Spirit's uh, power uh, to do that. So a recognition of sin in our flesh, a heart focused on God. Again, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. And, and li- listen to this verse once again. <clears throat> but sanctify the Lord God in your heart. That doesn't mean, okay, we're going to give him the left ventricle. Okay, we're going to separate him. No, it becomes the focus of the person in the core of the person, the heart. He becomes the focus. Now, what happens when a person ha- uh, has God as his focus? He lives differently. He's empowered to live differently. He wants to please God. He loves the brethren. He even loves his enemies, which I'm still struggling with. I don't have any enemies that I know of, but there's plenty of people out there that I wouldn't mind putting on that list, you know, that kind of a thing. Most of them are politicians, but that's another thing altogether. Uh, (laughs) But a whole point being is when they become the enemy, I know what my flesh wants to do. Yeah, come on. We'll take you on. <laughs> I'm, I'm not called to do that. I'm called to love them, to pray for them, to do good unto them so that hot coals be poured on their eye. Oh, boy, I really need the Spirit of God for that. Amen? Okay? Uh, whole point being is this person is living differently. And notice what the rest of the verse says. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. You know what that tells me? When you live differently, people are going to notice. Some of them are going to ask you, why are you like that? Be ready to give an answer. Because Jesus Christ changed me. I remember when, oh man, I used to be so bitter that I'd talk about my stepfather and I would literally tremble 
just ugh, not a problem anymore. Why? The Spirit of God has changed me. Forgiveness has been granted uh, both toward him and, and him toward me because um, I was a rebellious teenager <laughs> uh, that he had to deal with. Uh, so a heart focused on God. Uh, if you're going to put to death the deeds of the body, your heart's got to be focused on God. A meditation on God's word. Psalm 1-2. Uh, but his delight, he takes pleasure in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. Uh, verse 3 goes on to say, and he's going to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Go down there and mow the lawn there uh, next to the swamp. You see that willow tree and those cypress trees. They're just <laughs> drinking up that water. They love it. And they're growing and they're, they're getting big, that kind of thing. Um, it also requires a, a change of mind. Um, Romans 12, 2, uh, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And, and you see there are other verses there. Please take a look at them. It requires communion with God. Uh, Hebrews 4, 16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And if you're going to put to death the deeds of the body, it is going to require practiced obedience. When you know this is what you got to do, then you do it. When you know you shouldn't do that over there, then by God's grace, you don't do it. And if you put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit, he says, you will live. And again, you already have eternal life, so he's not talking about eternal life. He's talking about you're going to experience the abundant life. Uh, John 10.10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I don't know about you, but I've experienced being saved, having life. I've experienced being saved and experiencing the abundant life. The second is so much better than the first. The first only brings more problems, more difficulties, guilt, shame, um, regret. The second, there's nothing to be regretted. You live in communion with God. You experience his blessings. You see things differently than you used to see them. Doesn't mean you never complain, but you probably are a little bit more thankful than you used to be. You probably complain less, and you realize, man, we are a blessed people. So I can praise God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for the things you have done to recognize that we were twisted away from you uh, we were at enmity against you, and you're the one that opened our eyes, changed our hearts, straightened us up, gave us life, and put your spirit within us so that we might actually be able to experience abundant life, communion with you. We thank you for all of that, and we recognize, Lord, that in our day-to-day, -day, in our sanctification process, there are times when we get to experience that. There are times when we fall on our face. We thank you for the forgiveness that we have in Christ Jesus when we fall. We thank you that we are not utterly cast down because you hold our hand. We thank you, Lord, that you go before us and uh, you walk beside us and you take up our, our backside so that uh, we don't have to worry about attacks there. And Lord, we just look forward to the day when we will actually be able to experience by sight that which we understand by faith now. In the meantime, Give us grace to walk in a way that's honoring and pleasing to you, that we may shine as lights in the midst of a dark and perverse generation. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. You are dismissed. Have a good God-honoring week. For those of you that are able to be here on Wednesday, bring food, and we'll see you. Chapter 3, chapter 3.